I am very pleased to have the opportunity to share our research with everyone from Spring GX. So the title I chose for today's lecture is Catalyst Development Toward Effective Use of Resources. I hope that you can consider our research as an example of the green transformation that SPRING is aiming for. I will now provide this talk and hope that it can serve as a topic for discussion later in the breakout rooms. The first page summarizes what we are doing in our research lab. The metal catalyst labeled as M initiates various chemical reactions. It is divided into four main sections based on what is obtained from these chemical reactions and the approaches used in the reactions. Today, our focus will be on catalyst development for the utilization of resources and catalyst development for synthesis and degradation of polymers, such as polymer plastics. Additionally, we plan to discuss the development of new catalysts for these purposes. In discussing effective resource utilization, the central resource for today's topic is carbon. In addressing the question of where carbon elements are found, I would like to share my insights from daily life. This was part of our daily lives, actually before the COVID-19 pandemic. This is from when I went on a business trip to Spain, and I brought back red wine as a souvenir and prepared snacks, which I intend to share with the students. I'm in the process of slicing bread, placing tomatoes on top, sprinkling salt, and drizzling olive oil over them. I wonder where carbon is in this picture. Indeed, the bread is a hydrocarbon compound. Since tomatoes are rich in carbohydrates and contain sugars, they also have carbon in them. And of course, I myself am also composed of carbon atoms. And there are various other items too, like the plastic table and plates. All of these contain carbon atoms. When it comes to things without carbon, there are very few. The faucet of the water tap is made of metal without carbon. The blade of the knife is also made of metal. Same for the necklace chain and the ring. And everything else contains carbon atoms. Therefore, in the pursuit of a decarbonized society, if we were to eliminate carbon from the world, only the red portions would remain, and everything else would disappear and vanish. The term decarbonization refers to reducing dependence on carbon in energy systems. It doesn't mean completely removing all carbon from the world. Indeed, it's evident from here that carbon is the fundamental source of the material in our lives, our society, and even our existence. The chemical industry, particularly the organic chemistry sector that I'm focusing on, is based on carbon. And for the necessary items, like the plates or the table we mentioned earlier. I will briefly introduce how the raw materials have evolved and transformed to create them. We have been using fossil resources to produce chemical substances and chemical products. The period from the 19th century to the early 20th century is often referred to as the era of coal chemistry. Coal was subjected to dry reforming to produce gas, from which a substance called carbide was created. This marked the era of chemical processes based on acetylene as a raw material. By the mid-20th century, after World War II, the era of petrochemicals emerged. In this era, the low-boiling component of petroleum, called naphtha, 
was thermally cracked or decomposed by refining petroleum. And through distillation, the components were separated based on their weight, molecular size, and the number of carbon atoms. These fractions with two, three, four, and five carbon atoms, each has contributed to the development of the chemical industry. Currently, there is a shift from oil to natural gas for energy production. However, I believe the utilization of natural gas is still somewhat limited. Indeed, the chemical industry has been utilizing fossil resources to create essential items for our daily lives. Let's now shift our focus from fossil resources to renewable resources. I believe there are indeed many renewable resources available. For instance, one could consider carbon dioxide as a potential ultimate carbon resource. Carbon dioxide, CO2, does indeed contain carbon. Utilizing it to create necessary items could be considered an ideal carbon utilization process, in a sense. Furthermore, biomass, which consists of non-edible parts and currently is often only used for combustion, could be considered ideal if it were utilized not for generating heat energy, but rather for producing necessary materials. Furthermore, there is currently a significant issue of plastic waste accumulation, with much of it not being effectively utilized. Indeed, if we could effectively convert such waste plastic into useful products, it could also contribute to an ideal resource recycling flow. Chemistry is crucial when considering these matters. In the conventional use of fossil resources, as previously mentioned, the dominant approach involved breaking down petroleum through cracking, dividing naphtha into smaller carbon fragments of two, three, or four, and then assembling these fragments to create necessary products through synthetic chemistry. Moreover, natural gas and petroleum are composed solely of carbon and hydrogen. The carbon is in a reduced state. Therefore, to utilize these resources, oxidation reactions were the predominant chemical reactions. On the other hand, carbon dioxide has only one carbon atom and represents the ultimate combustion form of carbon. It's in the most oxidized state. If we intend to use such resources, it's clear that we would need to reduce the carbon back. Also, biomass consists of highly complex molecular networks intertwined together. In cases where processes like cracking cannot be applied to materials like biomass, the concept of decomposition chemistry becomes essential to break them down into smaller fragments, similar to what was done with petroleum earlier. Today, I would like to explain how catalysts, which are the focus of our research, can play a role in these contexts. Our research is positioned around the goal of effectively utilizing carbon dioxide. Dry ice is the solid form of carbon dioxide. Also, carbon dioxide fire extinguishers contain carbon dioxide. Here, it's listed as an extraction solvent, and in this context, supercritical carbon dioxide is used to remove only caffeine from coffee beans, producing decaffeinated coffee. Furthermore, carbon dioxide can be used to produce pharmaceuticals. Carbon dioxide is already utilized in various ways, so it's used for very different things. This water doesn't contain carbonation, but one of the primary uses of carbon dioxide is for carbonating beverages, such as adding fizz to drinks. There are indeed many such applications, but the quantities used in each application can be relatively small. Turning all the annually emitted carbon dioxide into dry ice and solidifying it would also be very energy-intensive and costly. 
Even if we consume carbon dioxide through various means, a significant amount is still emitted. It doesn't lead to effective carbon solidification in the long run. In comparison, the concept of using plastic as a raw material is seen as a target where a certain amount can be fixed and effectively utilized. However, to demonstrate this perspective, I prepared a bar graph. At the beginning, the annual carbon dioxide emissions amount to 33 billion metric tons. In contrast, here is the global plastic production. This mainly consists of polyethylene and polypropylene. I attempted a rough estimation of the total plastic production, which might be roughly twice the weight of polyethylene and polypropylene. Overall, it's around this magnitude, accounting for about 1.5% of the major emissions. For example, if half of that plastic production could be made from carbon dioxide, it would be about this amount of CO2 in this chart. However, instead of just burying it in the ground, there is potential for effective utilization. This is assuming the best case scenario, and it's important to note that this wouldn't become a reality immediately. However, I will discuss the potential for such outcomes. When I mentioned my intention to solidify carbon dioxide and create useful substances, my professor responded with, don't waste your time on such futile efforts. Just plant trees. If you plant trees, they will perform photosynthesis, converting carbon dioxide and water into glucose, which is a form of sugar. Some people hold the opinion of, don't waste time on unnecessary things. Let's just focus on reforestation. Indeed, photosynthesis is an excellent method of carbon fixation. But we must not forget that it requires expenses for the growth of trees. For example, nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, especially when it comes to phosphorus, concerns about depletion exist. Producing such fertilizers may require substantial energy. Furthermore, plants thrive when there is clean water available. Living in Japan, it's easy to overlook, because when you're here, clean water falls from the sky consistently. However, in the context of the world, this might be more of an exception rather than the norm. There are many deserts around the world, and especially in the Middle East. People rely on desalinating seawater to make it drinkable and use it for their livelihoods. For this purpose, a significant amount of energy is expended. Do you still want to go to such lengths to bring water and to use it to irrigate and grow plants? You might have a different way of thinking about it. When considering various perspectives, Relying solely on plants might not always be necessary or the only option. We believe that we should have a variety of means, rather than being overly specialized in just one approach. Let's talk about plastics then. I understand that the slide might be a bit crowded, but I'll explain it step by step. So please follow along with the pointer. Regarding plastics, they can also be referred to as synthetic resins. Resins originate from tree sap, and the solidification of pine resin results in a composition similar to plastics. That could be referred to as a type of plastic. Plastics are primarily composed of carbon and hydrogen, but they can also contain elements like oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine. These are polymers, meaning they consist of large molecules. They are formed by the bonding of numerous atoms, so they are also referred to as polymers. To explain how they bond, I've included a molecule called ethylene, where carbon atoms are connected by a double bond. It's a gas. Ethylene gas breaks one of the double bonds between CH2 and CH2 and forms a new bond with a neighboring CH2. 
In this manner, when numerous ethylene molecules are connected like this, it forms polyethylene. A polymer is formed when small fractions of monomers, which are repeating units like ethylene, are linked together. Polyethylene accounts for 24% of Japan's total plastic production. I believe it's one of the most familiar types of plastic for everyone, things like plastic bags. Also, items like shampoo bottles are all made from polyethylene. Polypropylene has one methyl group, connected to polyethylene CH2 and CH2 at one side of its chain. Compared to polyethylene, polypropylene has higher strength. I've brought some here. This is a food container. Maybe many of you have brought your lunch in lunch boxes today. The main container, made of polypropylene, can be microwaved. On the other hand, the lid, which is a bit softer, is made of polyethylene. When microwaving, if you can, it's a good practice to loosen the lid slightly or remove it. It's important to differentiate between polyethylene and polypropylene and use them appropriately. In reality, I actually made one of them unusable. Then, what's next? Polyvinyl chloride, commonly known as PVC, has chlorine atoms alternating with carbon atoms in its structure. I didn't bring any with me today. Things like Ultraman figures can also be made from PVC. Additionally, it can be used in more rigid forms, like rain gutters. Things like water pipes as well. While PVC itself is transparent, it's often mixed with various additives for different purposes. From rigid applications to flexible ones, erasers are also made from PVC. Its applications are incredibly diverse. Polystyrene is used for items like the white containers you find in supermarkets, like the bottoms of meat trays or expanded polystyrene foam in packaging materials. Polyethylene terephthalate is commonly known as PET. This is a PET bottle. Regarding the PET bottle, there's a campaign calling it the worst kind of plastic. If you drink water from a PET bottle and then throw it into the river, that makes you the villain, and this will become harmful. However, if you make sure to recycle this properly after drinking, PET bottles can now be recycled into new bottles through the recycling process. It's waste PET. The price of recycled PET has been soaring lately, and it's becoming quite scarce for recycling purposes. Despite this, PET is an excellent plastic for recycling due to its recyclability. So, instead of drinking water from PET bottles, some may believe that drinking water from paper packs is a way to protect the environment. However, that may not actually be the case. Inside paper milk cartons, there is a layer of plastic called lamination, and it's made of polyethylene. So when recycling these cartons, the paper part can be recycled, but the inner polyethylene layer usually ends up being discarded. When looking at the bigger picture, it's important to consider whether these actions are truly reducing environmental impact. Is it really the right approach for everyone to say that all plastics are bad and we should stop using them altogether? I hope everyone will take some time to think about this. Please continue with the discussion about polymers, and how they connect different things. Connecting carbon dioxide could indeed be a viable idea. Earlier, as I mentioned, if we connected ethylene to create polyethylene, then why not also connect carbon dioxide and turn it from monomers to polymers? I understand this, but it can be quite challenging. Here I have depicted a separated state of carbon dioxide. 
Here I have illustrated a state where carbon dioxide is connected. Why is it so difficult? When I was a first and second year student in the School of Science, we might use the term uphill to describe the situation. We use the phrase, you need to go uphill energetically to convey the idea that you need to expend energy to move upwards. However, since we also have students from humanities backgrounds this time, I've tried to draw a simplified contour line. This state of separated carbon dioxide is represented by the relatively flat areas, particularly in regions with lower levels. The state of being connected, on the other hand, can be likened to adjacent basins. At the beginning, there is an initial reference point. And within this three-dimensional landscape, there are mountains, plains, and basins. Imagine that all of you are shaking this board. Activation occurs due to heat. By doing so, the energetic ones are able to go beyond and reach the other side. They can pass through the mountain pass and reach the other side. Passing through this mountain pass and reaching the other side is along this line. So the energetic ones can cross over from this deep basin by going over the mountain pass, not the mountain, and go to the other side. They might not have enough energy to cross the mountain, but they can cross the mountain pass. This is a depiction of the part that crosses the pass, but the ones that were agitated and went up, as shown on the right-hand side, end up coming back to the lower level. Because carbon dioxide is energetically lower, no matter how much effort we put into shaking and adding thermal energy to drive the reaction, it will still revert. So, lifting up carbon dioxide alone is challenging. You need to input some form of energy, like light energy or electrical energy, in order to achieve that. Alternatively, as I will discuss next, our approach involves adding chemical energy. These blue molecules are monomers. We introduce a substance with higher chemical energy and combine it with carbon dioxide to raise the energy level of the starting system. By doing so, these two molecules can react and connect. As a result, the initial energy level becomes higher, resembling a shallower valley. This enables the molecules to descend into the deeper valley. This is precisely using the energy of these blue molecules to drive the reaction of carbon dioxide. Our research focuses on understanding the role of catalysts and what they do is to lower the energy of this mountain pass. We can lower the energy of the mountain pass by guiding it through other routes. It is challenging to alter the inherent stability of carbon dioxide molecules that arise from their natural formation by using catalysts. In order to move from here to here, energy is indeed required. Therefore, we are using chemical energy. Let's move on to the specifics. This is a method that is already in use. Ammonia and carbon dioxide are used to produce urea. Urea is also used as a fertilizer. Urea formaldehyde resin is produced from urea and formaldehyde. Alternatively, melamine can be produced from urea and then used to create melamine resin. Melamine resin is used in products like baby plates and dishes. However, since my child has grown up and is now in college, we don't have any of those items left at home, so I couldn't bring them today. Instead, I brought this melamine sponge with me. Students might not use it often, but this is really effective at removing stains, right? Yes, it is effective. <laughs> and earlier, I was really excited to discuss this. This is melamine resin. Bisphenol A, which has multiple benzene rings, is combined with carbon dioxide to create a plastic through polymerization. This is known as the Asahi chemical method. 
Polycarbonate is used to make organic glass for bullet train windows. When you compare the actual size of these molecules that are formed, the green part here, which is derived from CO2, is actually very small. This method has gained attention worldwide because it eliminates the use of the highly toxic compound phosgene. It has gained attention as a method that avoids the use of highly toxic substances rather than focusing on the utilization of carbon dioxide. Yes, after quite a bit of discussion, to sum it up briefly, we are combining molecules like propylene oxide and butadiene, which have higher energy levels. The combination of the blue components can create polymers. I want to show you this. Look at these aliphatic polycarbonates called PPC. Half of it is made from petroleum-derived propylene oxide, and the other half is made from carbon dioxide. Hold it a bit, and it's a bit satisfying to realize that it contains carbon dioxide, doesn't it? It's quite heavy. If a material doesn't have many applications, its market potential remains limited. It can also be combined with butadiene. This currently contains 43% carbon dioxide, and this molecule here is composed of 29% carbon dioxide. Polymerization reactions are progressing through these kinds of reactions. We are engaged in catalyst development for this purpose. For this molecule, when heat is applied, it easily breaks down and disappears. Disappearing here doesn't mean it disappears suddenly. Rather, it turns into gas and floats away. So, for example, you can create small holes using this plastic and then surround them with ceramics. Only the holes will pass through cleanly. There are applications like that. Instead of burning the plastic with oxygen and having it turn into ash or carbon residue, this plastic undergoes a clean decomposition into gases through heat. In that sense, it disappears neatly without burning. This feature finds applications where clean and complete removal is desired. Then, there is one more thing. Polyurethane is composed of soft segments and hard segments. Like this sock. Socks stretch when you pull them, right? That's because they are made with a blend of polyurethane. Polyurethane's hard segments form a network structure, while the soft segments allow it to stretch easily. That is why materials containing polyurethane have elasticity. It has been suggested that the current state of polymers, such as those containing carbon dioxide, can be used as the soft segments in polyurethane. Indeed, regarding polymers derived from butadiene as well, various considerations have been made, and many have been obtained. Please consider what the catalysts are able to achieve in this context. Earlier, I mentioned that adding blue to green is necessary because green alone wouldn't connect. However, blue alone might end up connecting, leaving green out. In this case, if the pass on this side is lower during the shaking process, the blue components might connect without mixing. And if the pass on that side is lower, they would naturally end up there. What we can achieve with catalyst is to control the height of this pass. With catalysts. If you just let it be, then this blue one will get connected. But by lowering the height of the pass, we can bring in materials containing carbon dioxide and make them connect. When butadiene and carbon dioxide are simply heated and allowed to react, only the blue butadiene tends to connect. 
In this case, the mixing connection ones could not overcome the pass on its own. Using a palladium catalyst, we were able to lower the pass in this region. And as a result, we connected atoms in a way that would not occur normally. And created plastic. And that is one of our research achievements. I have high expectations for this transparent resin. It's also scratch resistant. This is about butadiene being derived from petroleum. However, it's not just petroleum-derived butadiene. We also aim to utilize isoprene, which is a raw material for natural rubber. We aim to change it into a more sustainable form, by utilizing natural materials in a more sustainable way. We've discussed the topic of carbon dioxide up to this point. Lastly, I would like to talk a little bit about biomass and plastic waste. There's a thing called lignin. It's a component of wood. Obtaining cellulose from wood and converting it into pulp to make paper is one of the ways biomass is utilized. After extracting cellulose, about 30% of the wood remains as a complex structure, consisting of aromatic benzene rings, resulting in a dark brown, viscous material with a strong odor. Currently, lignin is mainly used as a fuel source since it has limited applications beyond that. Due to its viscous and sticky nature, lignin is challenging to burn efficiently as a fuel. Moreover, it doesn't serve as a highly efficient fuel source itself. As a result, when making paper, approximately 30% of the wood yields lignin, which is often considered a byproduct. We want to find ways to utilize this resource by processing and utilizing lignin effectively. For this purpose, catalysts are specially mentioned here, which contain a significant amount of oxygen. These catalysts facilitate the reaction of carbon-oxygen bonds with hydrogen, leading to more valuable compounds. And, for instance, we are considering the possibility of converting lignin into core raw materials such as benzene, toluene, and other natural compounds. For this purpose, we are conducting studies on catalysts to facilitate the conversion process. If this were a chemistry class, I would discuss it more. But I'll refrain from going into too much detail today. If there are any chemistry students here, feel free to reach out and ask any time. Dealing with extracted lignin seems to have posed quite a challenge. This opponent proved to be quite formidable. The expected bonds were indeed broken, but it seems that the molecules ended up connecting in different ways, so the reduction in molecular weight hasn't been as significant as anticipated. Now getting back to the previous topic of plastic, within the plastics, specifically at the inner circle, the brown part here is referred to as a thermoplastic resin. We call these the chocolate type. What does this mean? I have chocolate with me, but you know what chocolates are. Chocolate is melted and then cooled to solidify it. All of these are heated, then poured into molds and cooled to solidify for use. So, when you heat plastic products, they become similar to the melted state of the chocolate at the bottom. On the other hand, the grey thermosetting resin here is referred to as the biscuit type. What this means is that you mix the raw materials, heat and knead them until they are soft then put them into molds. After that, you place them in an oven and bake them. A usable form can be obtained after baking. Once it's baked and solidified, reheating it won't cause it to melt again. It's not possible to reshape it once it's been baked and solidified. It's an excellent material that can withstand high heat and is very strong and hard. But once it's solidified, that's it. If you want to use it again, you need to break it down and reprocess it. 
For the one that can be melted and solidified, you can reuse it by melting and reshaping it. But for the material that has been solidified by baking, you would need to break the bonds at the molecular level in order to reuse it. So we are currently working on a project to promote recycling of persistent polymers. Our research focuses on breaking down the connected molecules, dispersing them and guiding them to a cycle of endless renewal. While practical applications might still be distant, I hope I've been able to give you a glimpse into the potential roles that new science can play, and I hope you look at catalysts in a new light. These are the members of my laboratory. If you're interested in our work, please join us at any time. That's all. Thank you very much.